Chair Blake Spear, I just wanted to let you know that we do have a quorum. Okay, great. Well, we'll just start in one minute when it gets to be exactly eight. Okay. Well, it's exactly eight. So we're going to go ahead and start this meeting. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see some of you virtually. Um, it is the July 8th Executive Committee meeting at Sandag. So I'm going to officially call this meeting to order. And before we begin, I'd like to ask our interpreter, Ruth, to walk us through how to access our interpretation services. Ruth? Thank you. I'll repeat this message in English. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, por favor desplácese a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación que es el globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish, español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en celular o tableta, presione los puntos suspensivos, luego Interpretation y luego el idioma. To use the Zoom interpreting feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are located and click on the interpretation icon, which is the world. Then select your language. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone or tablet, please press the ellipses, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ruth. So our first item is non-agenda public comments. Are there any non-agenda public comments, Francesca? Thank you, Chair. We do have a couple of hands up from the public. Uh, I see three so far. We'll start with Mike Bullock, and Mike will be followed by the person with the phone number ending in 899. Mike, you can go ahead when you're ready. OK, thank you. <laughs> Got to exit full screen here so I can see my speech. Um, yeah, Honorable uh, Chair and Executive Committee members, uh, I'm Mike Bullock from Oceanside. Uh, I do support the five big moves. However, more needs to be done regarding climate change. I appreciate achieving the 20% reduction per capita driving by 2035 with respect to 2005 as required by SB 375. However, you are still forgetting the 80% reduction in emissions with respect to 1990 by 2030 by the industrialized world, which is our first climate stabilizing requirement. You can't expect your staff to take on climate stabilization without your explicit direction. Uh, as I said, human survival requires climate stabilization. In a 2011 letter to Sandag, the state attorney general wrote, quote, executive order S305 is designed to meet the environmental objective that is relevant under CEQA, climate stabilization. By the way, the 2050 requirement of S305 now applies to 2030, thanks to our inaction. Um, the attorney general's statement is that the environmental objective relevant under CEQA is climate stabilization. So why is Sandag taking the position, apparently, that a legal EIR under CEQA can ignore climate stabilization? Again, the California AG wrote that the environmental objective relevant under CEQA is climate stabilization. Also, please have your executive director produce a list of actions that can reduce driving in the short term. The price of oil is too high. The high price causes harm to low-income drivers and it feeds the genocidal naked aggression of Vladimir Putin. Today, he's quoted as saying Russia has barely started action in Ukraine. One way to reduce the price is to de decrease demand, which is in line with your mission. SB 375 and climate stabilization require less driving. Defeating Putin is in line with your mission. 
Our federal government is spending hundreds of billion dollars to supply weapons to Ukraine. That money cannot go to fund new transit systems. It is patriotic and it is in line with your mission to reduce driving. A good car parking system should be on that list also working to publicize and improve the shuttle to the airport. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker will be the person with the phone number ending in 899, who will be followed by Dr. Tim Bylash. Hi, Mary D here. Good morning, Executive Committee. I had to take a break in monitoring your meetings for a bit, but I'm sad to see that you've gone back to virtual meetings under the auspices of AB 361. What is problematic to me is that somehow you've determined that the people's business is too dangerous to conduct in person. And yet I see some of your social media feeds where you're out doing community meet and greets, holding and attending fundraisers, doing door knocking and all kinds of things that require closer contact. I've learned over time to pay attention to people, uh, far more attention to what people do, not what they say. Your agency has determined that in-person meetings are a reported threat to public health, and yet your actions on a personal level say quite the opposite. Please resume in-person meetings conduct your to conduct your business. If you're safe on the campaign trail, then you're safe at a Sandag meeting. Thank you. And our final sp speaker will be Dr. Tim Bylash. You can go ahead. Good morning, Executive uh, Sandag Board. Appreciate you taking our public comments. I support the previous two public comments. Uh, labels we use belie the complexity and yet the simplicity of a problem. And we spend a lot of time putting words to these issues. As I remember the review of the previous 30-year uh, plans, five-year plans, the 10-year re-updates, different parts of it, um, I, uh, I am amazed at how we identify a problem and then it seems to get buried and then we have to go back and try to do something about it and we keep uh, perhaps ignoring it. I didn't get as far with the RTP as, as I would have liked and I'm still learning. In that spirit, I offer these additional comments, especially in the context of climate stabilization. From the from my view of the technical appendix three in the goals and comparison regional performance measures, I believe produced by the county, table 3.1 appears to indicate lower uh, greenhouse gas and VMT reductions in 2050 compared uh, then for 2020 and 2035 when compared to 20, uh, 2008. Uh, in addition, looking at table TA 3.1, it appears to project four times as many pedestrian deaths in 2050 analysis as compared to 2008 or 2020. It also appears to show no improvement in average driving time of 28 minutes in 2050 compared to 2008 or 2020. I was pleasingly surprised that transit speeds appear to be three times faster than driving speeds. And uh, that can be a great selling point for the changes that are necessary. However, it also indicates that mass transit speeds as increasing from 10 to 13 miles per hour. And I would have hoped there'd be some better improvements in these overall improvements, particularly as we seek to integrate autonomous vehicles, which I would hope would improve efficiencies. The things that motivate me about these and might be emphasized in producing for our public consumption is cost, convenience, and time. If the June 1st County Transportation Study Guide workshop, uh, workshop is available on video, then it might help my uh, answering my questions. I appreciate your taking them and uh, continue working as hard as you do. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. That concludes the public commenters on this item. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna take member comments at the end of this executive committee meeting. So the next thing that we have is our consent calendar with three items on it, item two, three, and four. And I would entertain a motion. So move Chair Sotel Solis. Second. Okay, thank you very much. We have a motion by 
Mayor Sotelo Solis and a second by Mayor Gloria. You can go ahead and vote. Thank you, Chair. And just for the record, there were no public comments on this item, or on these items, rather. Uh, for North County Inland, Mayor Voss. Aye. Thank you. For North County Coastal, Chair Blakespear. Aye. For South County, Mayor Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. For East County, Mayor Minto. Minto, aye. For the City of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria. Aye. And for the County of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Aye. Thank you very much. And that item passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we're on to our reports. This is item number five. So first up is the legislative status report and I'm going to hand it over to Robin for some very exciting news. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Yes, we are very excited to share, as Hassan sent an email last Friday, that the state finally reached a deal on transportation funding. And last week, uh, the governor signed into law a significant budget package that provides $300 million to SANDAG to realign the Low San Rail Corridor. As you know, this is a project that we've been talking about for decades. And now, thanks to Senate President Pro Tem Atkins and the rest of the San Diego delegation, we have the money to move forward and clear environmental and design on the Low San Realignment Project. This is a huge coup for the San Diego region, and we're so pleased that we were able to make it happen. In addition to that um, earmark in the state budget, we also wanted to thank Senator Weso for $20 million that was included for SANDAG again to pay down bond balances. And then on top of all of that, we have the billions of dollars that was included in the transportation funding package for other categories like statewide transit and rail projects. There's nearly $8 billion in the budget for those purposes. Um, that's where the $300 million is coming out of. There's also a set aside for about $1.8 billion dollars just for Southern California transit and rail projects. Um, so lots of opportunity for us to continue to compete and bring more dollars to the region um, to help advance our transit leap move in the regional plan. In addition to that, there's about $1.2 billion for supply chain efforts. We're hoping that that's going to be um, a great opportunity for us to continue to seek funds for the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry. Active Transportation got about a billion dollars. That's a historic level of funding, four times what's usually included for um, bike and pedestrian projects. Um, the Active Transportation Grant Program at the state level has historically been extremely oversubscribed. So this gives us a great opportunity to continue to deliver bike projects throughout the region in advance um, in support of our regional early action plan program for bikeway projects. And then the last one I just want to highlight, there's tons in the budget, but um, for grade separation projects, there's $350 million. So that's a great category for things like the Palomar grade separation project. That's one that we got a federal earmark for under the last federal appropriations bill. We're hoping to get more under the next one. And this gives us an opportunity to leverage those different funding sources uh, to deliver this project. Outside of the state budget process, there's been lots of movement on uh, much of the legislation that we've been tracking and following as we get near the end of the legislative session. So I'll just run through a few of those. Um, Senate Bill 985. This was the one that Senator Waiso introduced on behalf of SANDAG to s help advance the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry project that continues to move through the legislative process and will be next heard by the Assembly Appropriations Committee in August. AB 1833 by Assemblymember Ward. This had to do with raising our procurement thresholds so that they were consistent with um, federal thresholds at this time. That one actually passed out of the legislature and is now headed to the governor for signature. So that's great news for us, NTS and NCTD. Assembly Bill 2367, also by Assemblymember Ward. This was the one that had to do with providing the authority to SANDAC to be able to fully implement our regional plan and sustainable community strategy. That's also headed to the governor for signature. And another one by Assemblymember Ward was AB 1640. This was one that the executive committee also took a support position on um, that has to do with establishing regional climate networks throughout California. That will next be heard by the Senate Appropriations Committee before it goes to the floor for final passage. 
And then lastly, SB 1169 by Senator Weso. This was a bill that originally had to do with the SR 125. That's now been um, amended to have to do with conducting a study on toll roads throughout the state. That's going to be heard by the Assembly Appropriations Committee uh, in August when the legislature comes back from recess. The last one on the list that we've been monitoring and, of course, talking about is SB 1105, which we have an item on the agenda for next. So I'll let um, the supervisor and Victoria cover that one under the next item. And then just briefly, on the federal side, wanted to let you know that the House Appropriations Committee did pass the Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development Bill out of committee um, last week. So that's set up for a floor vote next. Good news to keep the appropriate appropriation cycle moving forward. Um, we continue to work really hard with our partners in D.C. at the agency level and in Congress to support our staffing needs for the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry. Um, of course, working with our delegation immediately to help leverage the funding that we got from the state budget for the Los Angeles Realignment Project to see how we can start to um, match some of these pre-construction dollars with federal dollars to make sure we can move immediately into construction phase when we're ready. And then, of course, working with all of our partners throughout the San Diego region to compete in all of the new federal infrastructure grant programs that are coming out uh, day by day, it seems like. So we're really looking forward to continuing to bring those dollars back home um, as a result of what's going on in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. So with that, I'll pass it over to Hector for our bi-national update. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Good to see you virtually. Uh, I will share with you a little perspective from the border, and I will start mentioning that uh, the border community is paying attention to two big uh, events that are happening uh, in the future. One is next week visit of President of Mexico Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador to Washington DC. And the second is on the trilateral North American agenda, the next uh, North America summit to be held in Mexico in November with the participation of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, President of United Joe Biden of the United States, and the host president of Mexico, Lopez Obrador. In this framework, it's most likely that the macro topics will continue to be the traditional ones, illegal trafficking of drugs and guns, and also the management of the immigration phenomena, including the humanitarian crisis. But also the economic agenda will mark uh, the second anniversary of the free trade agreement, the USMCA, concentrating in strengthening the production uh, chains in a new global context, and the review of labor conditions in North America, as well as climate change, the environment, and clean energies, among others. In the bilateral agenda, as you were timely informed by our CEO, Hassani Krata, Sandak had the opportunity to meet with Ambassador Esteban Moctezuma. And on that occasion, your leadership presented San Diego's transformative vision with the intention of seeking a broader uh, border agenda between the two countries including the high level economic dialogue to elevate the border collaboration to higher standards. Also at a local level, addressing the issue of sewage spill into the Tijuana River continued to be a focal point. On June 17 of this uh, year, the US EPA released the draft programmatic environmental impact statement for public comments and a public meeting was held last week to provide updates. According to the schedules, the draft programmatic EIS, EIS sorry, should be finalized in November of this year. Also, a NEPA meeting will be held later this month and a record of decision is expected by December 2022. For this project, uh, the EPA is analyzing three alternatives. One includes no action and an alternative one with a core of projects and an alternative two with a supplement projects. All of these, including uh, activities in Mexico. Uh, the binational process includes an agreement with Mexico's uh, uh, National Water Commission, a conceptual framework for implementation of the comprehensive infrastructure solution, and a minute on the IBWC, the International Boundary and Water Commission, to be signed later this month. The other big traditional topics is uh, at the border is uh, the border wait times. Our border region is experimenting the worst or longer wait times in San Isidro and Otay Mesa. At San Isidro, who you know is the busiest international land border crossing of the world, queue lines of over six miles going north are now the common, representing hours of wait times and a terrible mobility condition in Tijuana. 
But in post-pandemic times, we learned that people coming from Mexico, in this case, are not necessarily Mexicans, not even the majority of travelers, but Americans returning to the United States. The New San Isidro Port of uh, Entry Director, Marisa Marin, stated some weeks ago that during peak hours, over 90% of crossers are US citizens or US residents, revealing the huge community of San Diegans that sleep in Tijuana. In this perspective, Tijuana understand is becoming the fourth largest community of San Diegans, but they are commuting every day, representing a valve for San Diego's housing pressure. Mobility and housing are the emerging topics. In this uh, realm, Sandag is implementing mobility initiatives to contribute to solve this pressure. A request for proposal is currently posted in our Sandag web to start developing the border to Bayshore Byway project to promote active transportation, linking the border to the regional network. Moreover, with Mexico, complement, uh, with Mexico's complement uh, uh, Ciclovia Binacional, these two projects are opening opportunities to add this mode of transportation between the two sides of the border. Also, last month, SANDAC, partnering with MTS and other border stakeholders, launched a work, the works to study and plan improvements to the San Isidro Transportation Center right at the border. Uh, and before I conclude, I just want to uh, mention that uh, uh, Chairwoman Erica Pinto from the Hamul Indian Village of California was appointed to serve on the Department of Interior Secretary Tribal uh, Advisory Committee uh, representing the Pacific regions. And we want to congratulate her representing our region. And with this, I conclude my report and will be available if you have any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, that was all very interesting. Um, are there any questions from uh, board members about this? Legislative update, good news in many ways. Okay, I don't see any. Thank you very much. Um, and let's just ask, are there public comments on this? Chair, sure, we do have one public comment on this item. Um, Mike Bullock, you can go ahead when you're ready. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was, uh, those are two fantastic reports and especially the, uh, the legislation uh, report, what's going on in Sacramento was very impressive. That was a long list of uh, very helpful actions. And it raises the question though, is it enough? And, and how do you define enough? And I would say that um, climate stabilization is the per correct perspective to, to ask that question, in which to ask that question. And that leads to the answer, um, is it enough or is it not enough? And, uh, you know, that's, uh, it's math and science. But um, in terms of what legislation is really needed to determine what is enough, well, that's uh, stated very clearly in the California Democratic Party platform. It says that there should be a plan showing a set of enforceable measures that taken together will cause cars that's our biggest emitter by far, cars, will cause cars to achieve the climate stabilization uh, requirements. I think it says targets in there, but it, it really is requirements. And the, and the first one is the most important. Are we doing enough? Is the state of California doing enough? Will we have to achieve that 2030 um, climate stabilization requirement? It's, it's, a, it's a large reduction. It's not gonna be easy. And if somebody was tasked with that, and, and many of you know that I have uh, produced uh, such a, uh, a plan. And I know, so I know exactly what it would take and it's not impossible, but it requires very fast uh, electrification and it requires very large driving reductions. And that 2030 target means you have to be realistic about what you can do you know, you can wave your hands about zoning and you can wave your hands about a lot of things, but it just is going to take too long. What you come down to is the stark realization that pricing is the only thing that gives us a fighting chance uh, to succeed. And so the state needs to be doing that. The state needs to be developing a, uh, a car parking system, which is fair 
and it needs to be developing a, um, it needs to replace the state gasoline tax with a means-based road use charge, means-based road use charge. Those pricing uh, strategies uh, are absolutely um, necessary. Um, and, and so you should be fighting to get that road use. And besides that, if you're going to get local funds, you're going to need that road use charge well before 2030. It has to happen. Thank you, Mr. Bullock. I apologize, but your time has expired. Uh, Chair, that does conclude the public comments on this item. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much. We will now move on to our next item, which is item number six. Um, okay, before we move on, would, forgive me, I should have raised my hand sooner. Oh, I just wanted to express, I, I, just a quick comment on, on the legislative reports. First off, always great reports and thank, thankful to staff. I just wanted to commend staff for the amount of state funding we're able to get. It's an extraordinary amount of money. Uh, a lot of that is due to the great leadership of our state delegation, in particular State Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins. Um, but you don't get entrusted with these kinds of dollars if you don't have an incredible organization with really good staff who are capable of executing big and important projects. And um, the staff spoke for themselves, but I think it's important to hear from the board or from this committee uh, our extreme appreciation for their effectiveness. Uh, these are extraordinary dollars. I mean, 300 million for uh, the bluffs, 20 million in debt retirement. Uh, those are big, big numbers. That's something we should all be proud of. And I just want to express my appreciation to the staff for their effectiveness in bringing those dollars to San Diego. Yes, thank you so much for saying that. That's really important to recognize. Okay, um, now we'll move on to the next item, which is item number six. Um, and this is Senate Bill 1105. Um, and I think the supervisor, Lawson Reamer, and also Victoria, I'll hand it to you, Victoria, to kick it off. Thank you. Good morning. As you may recall, on May 13th, the San Diego, San Diego County Supervisor Tara Lawson Reamer provided an overview to both the Executive Committee and the Sandag Board of Directors on SB 1105, the San Diego Regional Equitable and Environmentally Friendly Affordable Housing Act, sponsored by State Senator Ben Waysel. Subsequently, the Sandag Regional Equitable Housing Subcommittee took action on June 2nd to support the bill with amendments in the areas of governance, programmatic criteria, and revenue structure to align with the SANDAG enabling legislation 1703, AB 805, SANDAG staffing, and state and federal regulations. These amendments were ultimately accepted by the author, and SB 1105 is moving through the legislative process. I'll turn it over now to Supervisor Lawson Reamer to go over the legislation. Thank you. Maya Victoria, sorry, Daniel Tiger uh, fell, uh, had a had a, a technical glitch. Uh, that's what Avika is doing right now. Um, so thank you so much uh, for for the tee up. Um, just want to put some context. I think we all have been talking for a long time. I mean, we all know that we face a housing crisis here in San Diego County, and I think it's one of those issues that cuts across. Um, really, frankly, cuts across um, politics. It cuts across a lot of the divisions I think we face in our day to day way of working together. And so uh, I was really um, happy that we put together our regional equitable housing subcommittee um, that we could begin kind of thinking strategically about how we tackle this issue at a regional level. Um, and so I think we've been working on that. I reported back uh, about a month ago on some of the progress progress we've been making in that <laughs> subcommittee. <clears throat> so um, what we're what I want to talk a little bit about is uh, what we've been working on is an update and sort of next steps on one of the big things we've been working on. So as Victoria mentioned, um, Senator Wesso has put together this bill, SB 1105, which would be a regional housing finance authority for San Diego County. Um, and for context, uh, LA has is trying to run one up the chain in Sacramento and get that passed. And uh, San Francisco succeeded um, in, in getting one formed. And so that really puts us behind the, like really behind the curve in terms of being able to compete for regional funding and uh, statewide funding. Because as we all know, if we don't have matching funds locally, <clears throat> it's really hard to uh, bring any, any state or federal funds back to San Diego. Um, and so that was, I think, the big motivator behind this bill was the basic idea is that we need to figure out some mechanism, not only to have regional coordination around our housing strategy, but also how to generate some revenue and generate some funds um, so that we could then be able to bring home a lot more state 
money um, to, to support our housing investments in San Diego County. And just frankly, so we stop falling behind our other regions, right? So we continue to stay competitive um, and hopefully even get ahead. And so what we've been working on the last uh, six months or so is there's been this big task force, as I mentioned uh, last time I was here, of lots and lots of uh, stakeholders convening and talking about what would a uh, housing finance authority look like for San Diego, you know, given that we're different, we're not LA, we're not San Francisco, we're unique, we're different. Um, and you put together a lot of feedback, a lot of input for Senator Wesso. And I think, uh, frankly, I just want to commend Senator Wesso and his team for being just so incredibly responsive to the local process. Um, you know, what, we, what we've been doing here locally in terms of our regional housing, equitable housing subcommittee is really facilitating that local process of trying to figure out what a housing finance authority could and should look like for San Diego and sharing that feedback uh, with Senator Wesso. And I just think they've been so great. And um, the bill that is now uh, being considered in the legislature and is uh, what's what what is uh, up for our consideration today looks really nothing like the San Francisco or LA versions, and that's even though it started looking a lot like them, and that's just because there's been so much local input and local leadership on what that means um, for San Diego. So, I want to talk a little bit about some of that feedback and like what this bill looks like. Um, but I, but just to, for us to have some context of what the what the question is today is just asking that we as Sandag can support this bill um, so it can continue to move forward with Sandag support in the legislature. And, um, you know, I think there has been already a ton of support in the legislature for the bill and has a lot of momentum. Uh, but I think it's important for Sandag uh, to, to take a position um, and our regional equitable housing subcommittee voted unanimously a couple of weeks ago to bring this to the Sandag board. Um, and recommend that we support it. Um, and I really want to thank uh, Mayor Todd Gloria, Mayor Lisa Heedner, Mayor Satella Sleese, Councilmember Jack Shu, who um, have been very, very good partners in this. Um, and I just think it's been a process of a lot of input and a lot of feedback and a lot of things getting better and improving in ways that are uh, like really responsive to our region. So um, big picture, what this would do would, would be really to create like a how a coordinating body, a coordinating mechanism to raise revenue and support housing investments across our region. Um, what is kind of interesting to note is that there is a lot of alignment with Sandag, but it's not exactly the same as Sandag. So it would be its own body, but have a lot of alignment in terms of governance and shared staffing. Um, and you would be on, able to be on the a housing finance board if you're on the Sandag board so that we can continue to ensure that our transit priorities and our housing priorities are in alignment, but that's not uh, exactly the same agency. So it still have its own independence to be able to focus on housing, but there'd be a significant uh, overlap with Sandag staff and Sandag board leadership so that those two pieces of, of housing and transit continue to be intertwined. I think there's also like a ton of stuff that I felt like was really innovative, uh, focusing on sustainability and environmental sustainability that really came out of the working group. Um, I think really uh, interesting kind of tweaks around being able to opt in and opt out. Um, I really wanna thank uh, Mayor Hebner for her leadership on that and just really being, you know, I know I represent a lot of coastal cities and just, you know, really being cognizant of like the diversity of needs across our region and the need for, you know, jurisdictions to be able to opt out if the direction of the of the board is not, you know, in alignment with where they with where the jurisdiction wants to go in that particular policy area. Um, I thought that was really innovative. Um, so those are some big things I think are worth pointing out. Um, I think there's some innovative uh, financing mechanisms that were included due to uh, uh, feedback from some of our stakeholders, which I thought was really promising. Um, but I, and I think the other thing that's worth noting is the flexibility of the way this is designed, which is that basically, you know, it, at least 50% of any funds go straight to jurisdictions. Um, and then 50% would be, could be a regional pot to be used flexibly. But, you know, the board itself could decide 100% goes to jurisdictions, right? It has that flexibility to ensure like 100% goes to jurisdictions. It also has the flexibility to say, okay, we wanna have uh, strategic investments in some key areas where we know we need to triple down on resources regionally. So that's where we wanna concentrate our regional money. But um, there's a lot of flexibility and um, really does sort of figure, really does focus on how do we strengthen and provide additional resources to a lot of our already existing local jurisdictions and local governmental bodies. And really trying to figure out, you know, how do we align um, 
investment money with land use authority so that the same so you know cities who have land use authority also have additional resources to be being investing in um in housing um so i think it's a, it's a long bill there's a lot in there but i think those are sort of the big takeaways the big pieces um oh a couple other things to mention i think what's also really interesting about this is if you look at san francisco and la those really just focused on low-income housing um, and this uh, focuses a much more on like sort of low to, to middle income housing. So there's low and very low income um, affordable units and rental units, but there's also a first time home buyer program, uh, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty interesting, clearly like responding to a real need in our region for how do you get folks like into home ownership and get, you know, get the first foot in the door. Um, and so that's, I think, uh, I, li I personally like that a lot. I think that's, uh, it, it feels really important as like a need being met. Um, especially for young people who are, you know, trying to get their foot in the housing market and also historically disenfranchised and disadvantaged communities that have been not been able to access uh, capital to, to borrow and therefore, you know, begin building equity and um, and intergenerational wealth. I think that this goes does a lot in that regard. Um, and then what else would I just, I'm sorry. I'm just, oh, this is the other thing I wanted to say. I think there's something in here. Everyone will not like something in here for sure, which I think, you know, usually you don't, uh, you know, highlight all the things that people dislike, but I actually, in my opinion, um, given that I feel like uh, I've been a mediator of a process of lots of, you know, 40, 50 stakeholders, everyone disagreeing and uh, kind of trying to find compromise. Uh, to me, I feel like that was a, actually like a, a real source of strength when you can look at something and say, okay, you know, we have all these different stakeholders with different uh, priorities who've come together around the table and have been willing to, you know, um, get mostly behind something and, um, you know, and be excited about something that could be good for a region, even though it's not exactly everything they, they would have wanted. Um, so I think that to me, the kind of don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good has really been guiding this effort. And I've, I've really appreciated that with all the members of the, of the, the task force and all the members of the housing subcommittee. So that's been really great. Um, and, you know, I think the last thing I just want to say is like taking a step back, you know, I, I got involved in this working on this um, because I just saw like a big problem, right? I mean, we have a problem. We have a real problem. We have a housing crisis. And, you know, we could all kind of fight about, well, like who gets more of the resources and who has, you know, who gets to run the show. And I mean, I know that that's a lot of times what underlies a lot of our dynamics. Um, you know, and people have asked, well, why would you do this, Tara? Like you, you're, you're at the supervisor at the county. Why don't you just get all the money for the county? Like, why do you need another housing finance authority? Why doesn't the county just raise the money and then be in charge of housing? And I mean, my answer is that, yeah, okay, I understand that that would be nice and convenient for me, but it doesn't feel like very good policy because I actually think it's better if cities and jurisdictions and you know the entities who are really responsive to our local communities are really able to collaborate and have leadership in um, how we're designing our housing finance authority. And so I really, I really like an approach that like empowers all of our communities and brings folks to the table. Um, so I think those are the big kind of big highlights. Um, I don't know, procedurally, uh, Mayor Blakesburg, I'm sorry, Chair Blakesburg, if I should answer questions. Um, I think the only other thing I would say is that the, the bill right now kind of structurally and procedurally where it's at, it's moving forward to floor votes. And so now is the time for amendments. So I think what we're asking for now is just a, a show of support um, from the Sandag board that we should back the bill. Uh, with the acknowledgement that there's still room and scope for amendments. And in fact, I had a great uh, conversation with, um, or I didn't, my uh, Jeff from my team did, had a great conversation with Mayor Hebner yesterday, and we were sort of continuing to think about other amendments. And uh, Senator Wesso's staff has continued to say, great, you know, keep working on it, keep bringing amendments. So I think the, the what, what we're asking for today would be a vote of support for the bill, um, acknowledging that there's probably still going to be amendments. Um, you know, anyone who's been in the assembly knows that this is going to this goose is going to be cooked until you know two minutes before uh, it's passed. Um, and so, if anyone has you know thoughts or amendments, uh, there's still like a lot of scope and space for that. And I think anyone on the subcommittee would be super interested in having those conversations. So why don't I stop there? Okay. Well, why don't we take comments and questions together? I, I see three of the board. Um, have their hands up. So Mayor Sotelo Solis. 
So, second vice chair. Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. Thank you again, Chair Blake Spear, for uh, recognizing me. Thank you again to Supervisor Lawson Reamer for her leadership and to our committee. I'll be giving kudos right now. Um, you know, working class communities like National City are definitely and absolutely struggling <clears throat> in this economy. And we know that the housing um, availability and affordability is at the center of this crisis. So we know that rents have risen uh, over 30% in this last year, and people are forced to move farther and farther away from their jobs and the communities and families that they love. Uh, as was mentioned earlier by Hector, um, so many people crossing internationally uh, because of housing affordability. We know that homelessness and issues with the unsheltered is uh, also on the rise. And we need affordable housing, both big A and little a, subsidized and natural affordable housing. And we need a whole lot of it. <laughs> and we know that each of our uh, 18 cities, we can't do it alone. And we know that by solving or addressing a regional housing crisis um, with resources that we have um, independently needs to be leveraged by uh, resources, uh, both state and federal. And if Supervisor Lawson Reber can give us any more money at the county, hell, we'll take that too, right? Um, but I think uh, we really recognize that it's about collaboration and creating those uh, uh, spaces where we can leverage those dollars. So really, you know, as we look at this approach, it's because we benefit as an entire region. We're all empowering each other to build more affordable housing. Um, and, and I know that, and I've said it before, when my colleagues, both in North County and in the South Bay, are able to build more housing and affordable housing, uh, we all benefit because that means it helps teachers, it helps our firefighters, it helps our community, all that are dealing with first time home buyer limitations, as well as the ability to create uh, workforce housing that is essential or student housing. And congratulations to Mayor Gloria for so many ribbon cuttings. Shout out to you, uh, looking good over there. And I think it's really helping us address the needs, but also to setting the bar for what our region can do for the state of California. Um, I wanna give, uh, as was mentioned earlier by Supervisor uh, Lawson Reamer, shout out to our subcommittee. You know, it's the Regional Equitable Housing Subcommittee and Mayor Hebner, Mayor Gloria, Councilmember uh, Lacava, uh, Vice Mayor Jack Shu, and our chair, our fearless leader here. And we know what we've been um, addressing and having um, the recommendations from over 30 local organizations that have spent countless hours as part of the task force. It's truly been an inclusive process. And um, I have to give shout out to uh, Jennifer Lassar and her team uh, for hurting the cats as well. They have a mechanism that who knows, maybe Sandag can use. It's, a, it's a, how you feel about a specific policy. It's either a red, you know, and then it gradually goes down uh, to how we feel and accept uh, certain pieces of, um, you know, topics of discussion. And I thought that that's been really good because it brings the diverse perspectives and the voices to the table without stalling an entire idea, uh, whether it be uh, the workforce to environmental, addressing environmental uh, needs that all housing should be and should have. And uh, so I wanna give shout out to, to Jennifer and to Ari for, for their leadership in that. And so uh, again, just to highlight that task force includes the business community, builders, advocates, environmental groups, labor, homeless uh, service providers. And so rock stars, superstars, everybody who has given their uh, time and countless hours uh, to really discuss the details this is phase one, well, probably phase like 11, but we're really moving forward and it's, it's, it's gonna be you know, evolving, but with this piece of legislation, it really gives us 
as was mentioned earlier, that hand up and the opportunity to start leveraging. We're behind San Francisco, but they're a little bigger than us, um, but that's okay. You know, first the worst, second the best, as my, you know, as my children say. Uh, so we uh, are able to, to start uh, moving forward. So I encourage my colleagues to support this piece of legislation. Uh, yes, through the executive committee, so we can make that recommendation. But uh, as we move to the open board, on um, the full board uh, later this morning, I hope we can continue to uh, urge that support. And thank you to Senator Wesso and his team as well. So adelante, let's do this. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, Mayor Minto. Uh, good morning, everybody. I appreciate all the hard work. <clears throat> Excuse me. I appreciate all the hard work from the committee. I think it is important to take a look at how we do funding in our region. Um, I know the state certainly takes an awful lot of money, and sometimes we may not all agree about how the money gets back to you know, San Diego County. Um, my concern in this whole thing is that when we start um, having um, the ability to add so many new taxes, and the reason why I say so many new taxes is because it's talking about uh, parcel tax now on your um, uh, you know, property tax bill, uh, gross receipts to businesses, special business taxes, uh, documentary tax fees, and then uh, commercial linkage fees. And my concern is that, with, especially at this time, how that's going to affect our overall economy if this passes within the, you know, this year, for instance. People are paying more at the pumps. People are paying more biz at the uh, restaurants. Uh, if you go in and just get a couple eggs and some toast, I mean, you're paying almost $20 now. And now we're going to look at adding more taxation onto that commercial tax and onto that business tax. And then a special business tax, whatever that really is. And, and my guess is, is that, uh, that this has all kind of been worked out and discussed how this is going to work. Uh, but I, it's not really very clear to me. And I'm trying to read through things to, to understand it better. And, and I know you can answer that question. Uh, that's why I'm posing it, because I think it's important, because I know in my region, uh, for me to be able to support this, people are going to be asking the questions. Why are you sending more taxes my way? And in, a, in a, what I see as very um, uh, interesting and uh, innovative taxation, uh, but, but people in my region still are not very you know, receptive of it. So I just wanted to throw that out there and uh, give you the idea of people what I'm hearing from my community. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Blixer, can I answer those questions? Yeah, let me just do a quick time check that we definitely need to end by nine. So yes, please answer his question and then let's, we'll go to Mayor Hebner and then we also need to see if there are public comments. Okay. And, and any other of the exec committee members. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Mento. A couple, these are great questions. So I think a, a couple things to clarify. So first of all, uh, this bill doesn't actually impose any new taxes, right? So it would have to go to a vote of the voters. So what it does is it creates an agency that if the voters voted, could be able to then like collect and administer those taxes just for housing. So I think uh, from the point of view of voters, I would give me a lot of confidence it's knowing that I was voting, I knew what the money was going to be being spent on, right? That if I voted for it, for this uh, housing finance authority, I know it's for housing and that's for something else. So I think that's a really important clarification that there are no, nothing is being passed now. It's actually just creating opportunities for probably in a couple of years uh, for voters to vote on something, consider and, and vote on something. And so anything would have to go to the voters. Any revenue would have to go to the voters and be passed by the voters. I think that's has to, it's just we really super important to be really clear about upfront so that like this is only creating a kind of flexibility and options for the voters in the future. It doesn't actually create any new revenue or taxes right now. So that's important to note. Um, and I, then I think the sec, so just like kind of like big picture. Um, both on timing and then like what this does. And so it's not a timing issue is not, it's not now. And then who would actually be voting on something would be voters, not us in the end of the day. 
Um, and then I think the second thing, I think what I really appreciate about this is there's this opt out mechanism, right? So like, let's say some jurisdictions want to want more housing. And so they decide we want to vote for more housing. And so we're going to vote for more revenue and more and some kind of, you know, tax on $5 million homes, because we think if you sell a $5 million home, that should generate some revenue to support affordable housing for people making, you know, less than $100,000 a year. So maybe those jurisdictions decide that's a good idea. Maybe other jurisdictions decide it's not, but there's ability for jurisdictions to opt out. So I think those are the two things I would say, um, kind of in, in, in uh, kind of to clarify that there's that, that sort of like what this does is that it's creating options for voters and that there's a lot of flexibility for jurisdictions to opt out if they don't want housing. Uh, thank you very much for the clarification. And I did understand that this is actually just creating the vehicle to uh, perhaps have a, a you know ballot measure or, or whatever you want to call it later to get the voters to um, approve a taxation. My, my other, I guess a follow-up to that would be uh, because there's an opt-out option, uh, how much involvement has there been from the uh, uh, clerk's office or assessor's office? Uh, because holy mackerel, if you have one jurisdiction and property taxes that says we don't want to do this, and then you know you might have three or four different communities throughout the entire county that are opting in and out, of taxation measures? Mm -hmm. Well, that, I mean, right now we already have a diversity, like every jurisdiction, right, has their own taxation structure. So the tax assessor is, you know, very comfortable with administering, you know, national city and Santee have different taxation structures. That's sort of just how it works. So that's not, that's not an issue. I think the thing to know, right, is like pay in and you get something, right? So I think that's, that's a sense of fairness. Like if a jurisdiction says, hey, we want to pay more revenue so we can have more affordable housing. Great. If jurisdictions opt out, then they also, they also don't, won't get the housing investment. So it's sort of like, if you want to, Play, pay, you know, if you want to, you want to vote for more affordable housing in your jurisdiction, then great. And then you might get afford, then you'll get affordable housing. If you don't want to vote for it, then that's okay too. And then you won't get it. Thank you. So it's, I think it is, I just want to say it is actually different. And this actually came from MTS. So the, uh, M, the MTS is the, is a other body that has that sort of like um, opt out structure. And we thought that was a really um, kind of useful way of thinking about things, especially because, you know, knowing I represent the county, I think I've had firsthand this like very clear experience of how diverse our county is. Um, and like, you know, Mayor Minto, we've worked together and I have, you know, Mayor Huebner, like we're all in one county and, um, but very different um, jurisdictions. So I thought that that was a very useful approach. Okay, good. Um, thank you, Mayor Mento. Uh, Mayor Hubner. Yes, um, thanks so very much. I can see that we have some time issues. And so I think I will save my comments for when we discuss this at the board. And I know that this is going to be added to uh, consent. And I think it's important that it is discussed at the board level. And so um, I think it should be pulled and uh, for discussion. But I do want to quickly thank Supervisor Lawson Reamer for coming up with this idea. When I first heard about it, I remember I, I texted you, Chair, right away to say that I really wanted to be involved in this because coming from a small city with high land value, We've had really great difficulty in getting funding. Um, not only are we small, but our parcels are small. So that means our projects are smaller and they are, have a very difficult time um, uh, uh, qualifying for this sort of thing. Um, I also appreciated very much the fact that it is San Diego centric. Um, and that it's unique to those other big cities who are doing this. Um, and then I very much appreciate that I've been able to work with Supervisor Lawson Reamer and her staff on making amendments. So um, I am going to be supportive at the board of this with amendments and um, really uh, will, want to continue to work. I'll be discussing the amendments that I want at the board level um, and hoping that we can get some of those through. We've been very um, I've been really pleased so far with what we've been able to manage. Uh, this is legislation, so this when a bill is super specific to change it, it has to go back to legislation, which is harder. So I think that working on some of these amendments that we've already done have helped to kind of streamline it and make it a little bit more general with guidelines rather than mandates so that the board itself can be a little bit more nimble and, um, and adapting as we learn along there. So um, I will wait for the board for my further comments. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, and I'll just make a couple of comments. So I, I'm really excited about this as the mayor of a city that wants to build affordable housing and 
recognizes the amount of general fund money we have to put in, even when um, there's a project that's proposed to have tax credits and all sorts of other things. So having an actual revenue stream to, to support affordable housing would be a tremendous benefit to us. And I really like the idea of half of it or some portion of it coming directly to the city and then other parts that would be competed for. So I think that it could really kickstart housing right now where there are barriers um, that are pretty substantial for, for cities. So um, I, I'm, I'm excited about the, the prospects of this and also the idea that other city, other parts of the state are able to access greater pots of state money because they have this type of financing authority and we don't have it. Um, you know, we know every project that, that gets other money has some local match and um, it is, you know, it's a, it's a true reality that if we don't have that local match, we are not getting the, the financing we need for these projects. So, so I'm, I'm excited about the prospect of this and, um, and I'm going to be supporting it here at the exec uh, committee to move forward as well. So um, I'm going to ask for public comments, but then you might want to put together a possible motion supervisor. Uh, that we could move it forward uh, in six minutes to the next level. So um, Francesca, do we have any public comments? We do have three public comments on this item. Okay, uh, let's let's have public comments at two minutes each. Two minutes, perfect. Uh, Mike Bullock will be up first. I'm just gonna give production a moment to set that timer. All right, uh, Mike Bullock, you can go ahead when you're ready. You'll have two minutes. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I support uh, 1105 as far as that goes. But I want to bring people down to earth uh, just a little bit. You know, we are ignoring climate stabilization uh, in our discussions and, and, and what we want to achieve and so on and so forth. And I'll tell you, I would rather um, be homeless and have enough food to eat than to live in my beautiful 2,640 square foot home and be starving to death. Now, you may think I'm talking some sort of scare tactic or something, but that's, that is reality. That is climate destabilization, a devastating collapse of the human population caused by uh, mass starvation. So uh, there have been an awful lot of words stated about this thing, and um, some of them were useful. Uh, like I heard environmental sustainability from the supervisor, but I don't know what that means. Um, and let, let's go back to a, a earlier time. Kevin Faulkner was mayor, and I don't consider him to be a, a, a great environmentalist, but nevertheless, he said that um, apartment complexes that are built around transit, sufficiently close to transit stations, um, should have unbundled car parking, and uh, the amount of parking should uh, could go all the way to zero if they wanted. There would be no, no requirement. Now, that's a pretty half-baked idea. Really, I mean, that's, that, that's half-baked. And yet, it was the best idea out there. It still is the best idea out there. The reason it's half-baked, obviously, is because people are gonna park in the neighborhood. The neighbors aren't gonna like it. We just don't have a car parking plan, which makes sense. Now, certainly unbundling the cost of parking should be a requirement for any, anything built with this, uh, with this money. In other words, we should give people the choice over what they want to do with their money. If they want a lot of parking, they pay for it. If they want none, they don't pay for it. I see I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be Dr. Tim Bylish, who will be followed by the person with the phone number ending in 899. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Exec Committee, and uh, for taking my comments. Tim Bylash up in Mid-County Coastal. <clears throat> Mike Bullock, please keep up your efforts. Um, to speak to SB 1105, it really sounds exciting and what an impressive undertaking. And I echo Supervisor Reamers and the thank the members' comments this morning. I find them very informative. However, we should not lose sight how creating another board that may enhance or block the type of interagency functioning SANDAG has provided and uh, with demonstrated exemplary jobs, integrating exactly the back and forth necessary between government and uh, agencies and uh, other parties. The ultimate goal is improvement in housing and how all of that makes San Diego prosper. Uh, people are moving into San Diego, but many are moving out of uh, population replacement. 
taxing to create funding that does not translate into families living and working in comfortable integrated units that provide a stable climate is a problem. Right now, San Diego is not an affordable city for workers. And although it boasts fewer million dollar units than New York City does, they are higher priced ones. And the issue of gentrification is always aside these efforts. Without worker rather than investor wealth, it may recreate the history of a city such as Detroit uh, was during the auto boom times. Uh, thank you. Uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. And our final speaker will be the person with the phone number ending in 899. You'll have two minutes. You can go ahead. Hi, Mary D here. I'll be very quick because I want to be respectful of the time also. Uh, first, I will say you probably shouldn't have canceled the June meeting. Um, if your meetings are going to run long like this or you're going to have a lot of items, then uh, have the meeting so the public gets their full time to talk. First of all, thank you, Mayor Minto. You nailed it. I am adamantly opposed to the Sandag supporting SB 1105. The region does not need yet another government agency, particularly one that has the authority to levy, levy taxes. I urge you not to not support this measure. Focus on getting Sandeg's own house as well as each of your own respective uh, municipal and government agencies and house in order first. Become good stewards of taxpayer money before you try to create yet another agency, one that will likely drive housing prices up and make housing costs even less affordable for existing homeowners. Focus on policy making within each of your own respective agencies. We do not need another bureaucratic agency. Thank you. Thank you, and Chair, that concludes the public commenters. Okay, thank you. Uh, Supervisor, would you like to make a motion? Um, so I, I'd like to make a motion there, Chair. Uh, oh, okay. Mayor Sotelo Solis moved to approve uh, this item to go to the full board with um, uh, approval from the exec committee. Thank you. And I, I'm happy to second uh, Mayor Sotelo Solis's motion. Okay, great. Let's go ahead and vote. Thank you. And uh, just to state the motion was to approve taking a support position on SB 1105. Is that correct? Thank you. Correct. For the city of San Diego, Vice Chair Gloria. Aye. For the county of San Diego, Supervisor Lawson Reamer. Aye. For East County, Mayor Minto. Um, at this time, I'm a no. Thank you. Uh, for North County Coastal, Chair Blakespear. Aye. For North County Inland, Mayor Voss. Nope. And for South County, uh, Second Vice Chair Sotelo Solis. Sotelo Solis, aye. Thank you very much. And that item does pass with four yeses and two noes. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, it is 9.01, so this meeting is adjourned. Our next meeting is September 9 at 8 a.m., um, and we will see you over at the, at the other meeting. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.